the best hip hop and pop music in America while helping to stamp out hunger in the city of angels. Just happy, it makes me happy. His music's so great. Been a big fan since I was a little kid. From Jay Z, one last wave for the fans he hopes will come out to support him and a good cause on these very steps come Labor Day weekend. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. Councilman Jose Huizar, who represents downtown, however, is not so enthusiastic, saying the festival is likely to shut down streets near Grand Park and City Hall for several days, impacting residents and businesses. With pump prices at above $4 a gallon, transportation experts are suggesting alternative methods to help Angelinos enjoy the summer on a budget. Rasha Goel has more. Metro officials and experts from the Automobile Club of Southern California are offering drivers tips on how to spend their summer vacation money more on fun and less on gas. Using the Metro is one of them. A $5 day pass gets you in and around Los Angeles. You can go Metro to sporting events at Staples Center and Dodger Stadium, to concerts, movies, and dining at LA Live, uh, Disney Hall, and the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. And the Expo Line also takes you to places like Thai Town, Long Beach, and the Natural History Museum of L.A. County. And the director of exhibits at the museum says he's given up one of his family's cars in favor of using public transportation more often. Every day, I now take the metro to work, and my car is off the road, which is better for the environment, and I get here faster. It may not always be feasible to use the metro, so in those cases, AAA has some great tips on how to save on gas money. Drive at or a little below the speed limit. We're, we're on a hurry. There's a lot of traffic in L.A., but resist that urge because every time you rush, you're wasting fuel. The number two tip is to accelerate and stop gently. No jackrabbit starts. You want to just put your foot on the throttle gently and accelerate up to the speed that you're going and then maintain that speed. And then the third tip is to look ahead of you, scan forward. If you see stop traffic or a red light, take your foot off the accelerator and coast up to that light. When you're coasting, you use almost no fuel at all. Another tip is ensuring your car has proper tire inflation. Following these tips can help double your car's fuel economy. You want to use the inflation pressure that's on the placard that the manufacturer provided in the door jam of the car, not the number that's on the side of the tires. That number is the maximum pressure that those tires can have without damage, not the proper pressure to use when you're driving. Since we aren't in the Stone Ages anymore, a little saving goes a long way. I'm Rasha Goel for L.A. This Week. If you do need to get behind the wheel, police are reminding drivers, especially teen drivers, to be cautious. A reminder that's especially important as teens may be tempted this graduation season to text and drive or drink and drive. Anna Marcos has more. These so-called fatal vision goggles are the weapon of choice as police and law enforcement launch a two-pronged assault on drinking and driving and on texting while driving as high school graduation time approaches. The goggles in this driving demo provide a simulation of a driver's vision while drunk. And these Panorama High School students find out it ain't pretty. I didn't know it would be that bad when you're driving drunk. I mean, the goggles uh, were supposed to simulate how, I, how it was supposed to be like when you were drunk. And so I had trouble looking and trying to see the cones and trying to know where to go. No friend should allow you to get behind the wheel after you had one or two drinks. Uh, buzz is still considered drinking and driving. But nowadays, traffic officers must fight another danger as lethal as drinking and driving. And that is distracted driving, especially among teens who text and use cell phones. This new lookup campaign brings awareness to the dangers of texting and driving, providing thumb bands as reminders for drivers who take the safe driving pledge. Officers will visit more than 50 schools in the valley before graduation to get out the word to some 70,000 students. From an officer standpoint, texting or talking on a cell phone looks like a DUI driver. Studies show drivers who use handheld devices are four times more likely to get in an accident. And young teen drivers have the highest number of distracted-related fatal accidents. But if statistics and driver simulations aren't enough to help them drive straight, these cops always bring along their crash car to highlight what can happen when you drive either drunk or distracted. Call someone. Don't let the LAPD, the CHP, or school police 
be your designated driver. The aim here is to give these and other teens a distraction-free, drunk-free, and accident-free graduation season. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. And officers have come up with a safe driving pledge not only for the students but for their parents as well. Patients at the St. John's Well Child and Family Center in South Los Angeles are experiencing a whole new level of medical care. Yana Kay explains. These patients in the waiting room at the St. John's Well Child and Family Center in South Los Angeles have plenty of space to stretch out thanks to upgrades that double the size of the clinic's open space. It means a good thing. I have, we have six children, so all of them come here, from the youngest to the oldest. Community members and other city and federal officials celebrated the new campus with a ribbon cutting, followed by helping folks get enrolled in a plan and other health activities. This is for you. This is for the patients of South Central Los Angeles. This is about the Affordable Care Act and health care for all. The improvements include two new health centers with space for expanded medical and dental services. The new campus will be able to accommodate more than 30,000 patients. This means that I have patients who are really proud and excited to come see the doctor, and it's a pleasant experience for them, which is also a great thing. The new facility was made possible in part by President Barack Obama's Affordable Care Act, which provided $9.4 million in funding to the center. The funding was supplemented by other contributors, including the S. Mark Taper Foundation. Working with foundations, what we can do when we put our minds to it, there's just nothing we can't accomplish. A big accomplishment that officials hope will get everyone the health care they deserve. I'm Yana Kay for LA This Week. Officials say the new campus is also open to those who are not covered by health insurance. And when it comes to our health, eating right is key. That's why one chef is hoping to teach students from the city's after-school enrichment program how to boost their food IQ. If you don't want to put it, don't put it. But I would I suggest you guys try. Even the basil. Smell the basil. Former Disney chef Gino Campagna has the same unbridled energy of a young child, making him the perfect chef to give students from Griffin Avenue Elementary School a hands-on demonstration on how to prepare their own healthy snacks. And we've been trying to introduce healthier and a fresher recipe for children to make snacks because uh, kids get 30% of the daily intake of calories from snacks. So we want their snacks to be healthy, tasty, and homemade. The cooking event was made possible by a partnership between Chef Campania's Culinary School for Kids, the Got Milk campaign, and the city's LA's best after-school enrichment program. Our mission, our final mission, is to raise American children food IQ. And, for, and by that I mean expose them to better food choices, but also to food preparation, because kids can sure help in the kitchen, and the family that cooks together stays together. There's no kitchen, no stove required, no uh, knives required. Uh, the children can safely do them, learn them at school, and then replicate them at home. The hope is students will learn to grab an apple or a fruit smoothie instead of a chocolate bar the next time their stomach grows. The Hanson Dam Recreation Center is known for great hikes and its beautiful scenery. Now, thanks to a shiny new ranger station, there's an added sense of safety and security. Yana Kay has more. Albert Torres has been a park ranger for the last four decades, and now he's thrilled to be working out of a newly built ranger station at Hanson Dam because he says it will help him perform his job even better. It makes me feel um, uh, very satisfied and also very challenged because it is a question of being in the right place at the right time picking up that phone, answering the radio call, being there. City officials and community members gathered for a ribbon cutting ceremony to officially open the new modern ranger station in Silmar. It's a great opportunity and a great location within the park for now the community to come in. It just creates a presence. The station will provide emergency and other services while servicing as the gateway for the Hanson Dam Recreation Center, which is home to many horse and hiking trails. I'm super excited. I, I mean, I want to come out here and start hiking and doing... Um, that's what I like, and then I, it's just very beautiful. The 4,600 square foot modern facility brings the outdoors in with tons of natural light, 
thanks to its floor-to-ceiling windows. It also includes a visitor center, community lobby, and public counter. I firmly believe that it's important for us to make sure that we prioritize this type of service, this type of access, this type of recreation opportunity. Council Member Fuentes says that while this ranger station is a great addition to the area, it will also allow the city to efficiently deploy services to other parks in the San Fernando Valley. I'm Yana Kay for LA This Week. The new station costs $10 million to build and was partly funded by Proposition K. Tips are needed to help solve the murders of a woman and her young child. A fund is set up to help families in the aftermath of the Humboldt bus crash. And Despicable Me could help boost L.A. tourism. These stories and more in City Beat. Homicide detectives are asking for the public's help in providing information in the case of the double murders of 28-year-old Hisela Yali and her one-year-old son, Dylan Reyes. The victims were found in a burning, converted garage on March 5th when the LA Fire Department responded to a house fire in the 100 block of East 50th Street. Hisela's husband, who was not home when the fire occurred, urges those who may know something to come forward. I couldn't save my family, but who knows, maybe... Whoever did it may, may be planning to do some the same thing to other family. I mean, so maybe the community could help someone else. Police say Hesela Reyes was restrained when firefighters found her. A vigil was held at Dorsey High School in memory of Jennifer Bonilla, a 17-year-old honor student who was among 10 students and chaperones killed on April 11th when a FedEx truck crashed into their bus as they headed to tour Humboldt State University. Meanwhile, ShareFest is joining with LA City Councilman Joe Buscaino to raise money to assist victims and their families through any financial hardships in the aftermath of the crash. For information on the Humboldt Bus Crash Victims Assistance Fund, go to sharefestinc.org. Mayor Eric Garcetti and Councilman Curran Price were among those who attended the ribbon cutting of the new Northgate Gonzales Market in South Los Angeles. The market, located in the Juanita Tate Marketplace at the corner of Slauson and Central Avenues, is providing nearly 200 jobs and fresh produce to that area of South L.A. The lead investor is California Freshworks Fund, which awarded Northgate Gonzalez a $50,000 grant and $5.5 million in loans. Mayor Eric Garcetti helped celebrate the opening of a 3D ride at Universal Studios Hollywood that's based on the film franchise Despicable Me. The mayor and Universal Studios are hoping the army of yellow minions can help attract even more tourists to Los Angeles. We're well on our way to our goal of 50 million visitors by 2020, and Universal is going to be responsible for half of that increase. There is also a new play zone next to the ride that includes water and other interactive features. One of L.A. City leaders is polishing his star as he gets set to appear on a soap opera. But it's all for the cause of L.A.'s abandoned animals. Anna Marcos has more from the set of The Bold and the Beautiful. That's right, Mr. Parks, find your mark. It's lights, camera, action, and the TV soap opera The Bold and the Beautiful rolls out a new star. Councilmember Bernard Parks interacts with two of the show's characters, Liam Spencer and Hope Logan, as they adopt a pet at the South L.A. Animal Shelter in several upcoming episodes. I hope we're just going to play it by ear myself. I just hope we just kind of wander through it and let him do a lot of splicing. He was amazing. The councilman was so great to work with and he answered our questions so beautifully. Before you think the council member is about to change careers and abandon the city he represents, he's actually promoting it. Or at least he's promoting the South LA Animal Shelter, which he helped get built with Prop F funds in a formerly blighted area. Before this facility, uh, the community would have to go to San Pedro or East LA or to 10th Avenue and Exposition. There were no services located in this immediate area, and so the community was somewhat abandoned. The story on the bold and the beautiful highlights the plight of L.A.'s abandoned pets and the critical services animal shelters provide as the city aims to become a no-kill zone. We are trying to spread awareness about the importance of animal shelters and how important it is for people to adopt animals. By the way, Parks is no showbiz newcomer. He appeared on the sitcom Girlfriends, playing himself, and he was named one of People magazine's 50 most beautiful people in 1998. 
But for today, at least, it's a wrap. And it's back to the business of running the city, animal shelters included. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. The Bold and the Beautiful storyline featuring Councilmember Parks is set to air on KCBS Channel 2 at 12.30 p.m. on April 30th, May 1st, and May 2nd. But make sure to check your local listings. In this week's list of things to do, Fiesta Broadway on Cinco de Mayo, the Brewery Art Walk, and music of the Mad Men era. If you watch Glee or if you watched 30 Rock, you'll know the star of TV and Broadway, Cheyenne Jackson. He'll be performing the music of the Mad Men era at the Walt Disney Concert Hall on Saturday, April 26th at 8 p.m. The concert will also feature special guests Jane Lynch and Rebecca Romaine. Cheyenne Jackson takes you back to a time when Bossa Nova was new, the lounges of Las Vegas were hip, and catchy dance music was spinning on every hi-fi. It will be an evening that'll have you swinging to the tunes of the 1950s and 60s. The Disney Concert Hall is located at 111 South Grand Avenue. For more information, visit LAPhil.com. While art walks have grown quite popular in the last few years, the Brewery Art Walk on Saturday and Sunday, April 26th and 27th, still stands out. Artists residing and working at the Brewery Industrial Buildings Complex have opened their studio or homes to the public every year, and most recently twice a year for 32 years. You will have the opportunity to see new works, speak with the artists, and purchase artwork directly from the artists' studios. Resident artists have been experimenting with 3D printing, LED lighting sculpture, as well as performance art, just to name a few mediums. The Brewery Arts Complex is located downtown at 2100 North Main Street, Unit A10. The walks take place from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. both days. Go to breweryartwalk.com for details. And the largest Cinco de Mayo celebration in the country takes place on Sunday, April 27th. The 25th annual Fiesta Broadway will feature both renowned and local Latino entertainment. Fiesta Broadway will take place along Broadway downtown around the streets of Grand Park and City Hall from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. An estimated 300,000 people are expected at the free event being billed, the largest Hispanic event in the country's largest Hispanic market. Go to FiestaBroadway.LA. And that's a look at some upcoming things to do. And in This Week in Tweets, we highlight some photos tweeted by the Los Angeles Zoo and Botanical Gardens. The LA Zoo is very active on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So if you ever need a little cheering up, the LA Zoo is a great source for cute animal pics. And last week, the zoo had some fun wishing its followers a happy catter day at the zoo with a picture of this leopard. Then the next day, the zoo posted this sloth Sunday picture asking folks to come hang with us. And the next day, asking, do you know what day it is, the zoo wished everyone a meerkat monday the zoo even got to make a wish come true when it hosted max a young man from michigan's make a wish foundation who wanted to hang out at a zoo with animal expert jeff corwin the tweet accompanying this photo says today his wish was granted at the la zoo well, for those of you with a need for speed, you're in luck because the Red Bull Rally Cross race is coming to San Pedro, and some folks got an early preview of what's to come. Yana Kay has more. Councilmember Joe Buscaino gets his heart pumping as he takes off in this race car in San Pedro. It was fast. It was fun. Um, my driver cut the apex, did a great job, and stayed on course. But at the end of the day, I'm back alive. <laughs> and I can get home to my family safe and sound. It was all part of the Red Bull Global Rally Cross Preview event, kicking off the 2014 race season, and drivers got a chance to test out their cars on the terrain before the race in September. They're tons of fun uh, to drive, and um, I really enjoy it. Buscaino says the ultimate goal of the event is to highlight San Pedro and boost the local economy by bringing thousands of motorsports racing fans to the area. To have a name brand like Red Bull come in and showcase the port is a win-win for the city, for the port, for the residents here in the harbor area. The track set up here at the Port of Los Angeles's Outer Harbor is made up of dirt and asphalt, and small but fast cars go head-to-head -head in jumps and sprint-style races. We've got a perfect, you know, palette for a racetrack right here. Big open space, you got the water all around. I think the scenery is amazing. 
I mean, you got ships, industrial, it's a little bit of everything. Some of the biggest names in motorsports will descend upon San Pedro during the two-day event and will surely keep fans on the edge of their seats. I'm Yana Kay for LA This Week. The rally cross race takes place September 19th to 20th at the southern end of Minor Street in San Pedro. And that's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. A reminder that you could catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week. Well, it's a little tight, but you know what? California is earthquake country. We're all in this together. Bulky item pickup? Call 311, the toll-free number for non-emergency services. 311, your one call to City Hall. Hi, I'm Zadie. Welcome to the Pacific Palisade. And you're watching Channel 35. It's our city and our channel.
Okay, sergeants, call the members. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Biden.
Sergeant, please find me one more member so that we can begin. Good morning, good morning. Shh. It is Friday, April 25th. I want to welcome you to your Los Angeles City Council. This council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday at 10 a.m., and the public is uh, welcome, always welcome. Madam uh, Clerk, I believe we have a quorum. Could you please call the roll? Bloomingfield, Bonham, Buscaino, Cedillo, Englander, Fuentes, Wizard, Caress, Recorian, LaBange, Martinez, O'Farrell, Parks, Price, Wesson. 11 members present in a quorum, Mr. President. All righty, then. Uh, first order of business. Approval of the minutes. O'Farrell moves, Martinez seconds. Next. Committed to resolutions for approval. Caress moves, Parks seconds. That brings us where? Mr. President, there is a request to continue item 2 to May 9th. Without objection, so ordered. Items 1 through 8 are items for which public hearings have been held. Okay, specials uh, members, we're on items one through eight. I do not see any. Uh, Mr. Krikorian? Number six, please. Six for Mr. Krikorian, Mr. Parks. Oh, so it's just, we're going to hold uh, item six for Krikorian and Parks. Uh, let's prepare to vote on the remaining items. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That brings us where? Items 9 through 11 are items which public hearings have not been held. 10 votes required for consideration. Okay, so without objection, those items are now before uh, this body. Do we have cards? Yes, cards on items 9, 10, 11. Okay, let's move on to what do we have left? Item 12, is it? Yes, Mr. President, that's in the special meeting. So then we'll hold off on that. That would then bring us where? To presentations or items called special. Mr. LaBange, are you ready? So what we're going to do now, we're going to start our the presentation portion of today's council meeting, and we'll start off with Mr. LaBange. Mr. LeBange, the floor is yours. I'd I like to ask the great chairman of uh, Arts and Parks, uh, Mr. O'Farrell, to join me as well right now. John Sabo, the city librarian. And a librarian. great chairman he is, the Mr. Great LeBange. chairman, all the friends of the library. Please join us here, right here in the hall of City Hall. Welcome, everybody, to the John Farrell Speaking Chambers. Speaking to the mic, Tom. I'll use the microphone, Mr. President. I'm sorry. I've never not used it. We're here today to salute... These are the volunteers of the Los Angeles Public Library System. Give them a big hand. These are also the heads of the Friends of the Los Angeles Libraries, right here. I'm joined by Mr. O'Farrell, our colleague right here. In his district was my library, Coinga Branch Library. And I just got to start it off, Mr. President. You could tell us your book, my book, Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel. And Mary Ann was the steam shovel. And Mike dug the town of Popperville and the whole story. And I still read it to this day to help me through the day. There you go. Very special, our first books, but very special, 
our librarians, and very special, the volunteers of the library. In talking to Mr. Sabo last year, our librarian, about issues, I said, there's a lot of friends out there that we should say thank you, because you cannot say thank you enough. So we picked this day to say thank you to the volunteers, and thank you to the variety of friend groups that are there. And I want to read some of this, if I could, very briefly, to salute all of us here in the libraries, that each of you should have a deputy who's absolutely embedded with our library departments to help in any which way possible. We salute the Board of Commissioners and Mayor Garcetti for this. More than 5,600 volunteers at the public library have given more than 173,000 hours of service this past year, which is priceless in its value. Uh, but in time, if it was time, it would be well over almost uh, $5 million worth of dedicated service, dedicated to the central and 72 branches throughout and the Friends Groups, which uh, does a very great outreach to get people involved with the library program, and advocate for libraries, institutions throughout the city. There's uh, 72 great branches, which is so important. April is National Volunteer Month, and saluting the libraries and this week, so we brought us all together, so this commendation will be presented to Mr. Sable. But I want to ask my, our dear friend, Mitchell Farrell, <laughs> who uh, has uh, such a great fan of all the knowledge for a few remarks. Please welcome Mr. Mitchell Farrell. Thank you. Council. Thank you, Councilman Blabange. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to just acknowledge a, a several year volunteer who lives in Atwater Village, a constituent of mine, Teresa Dietlin, who's here today. Teresa, she deserves a big round of applause. It is a real pleasure to stand here and recognize the few of the many volunteers who dedicate countless hours to the library, all for the betterment of our community. Los Angeles is fortunate to have one of the nation's great library systems. Here's Teresa. Yay. With a central library and 72 branches throughout the city. I've said this, I say this publicly everywhere I, I can, I grew up through the public library system and through the libraries and the public schools that I went to. Uh, that is really what helped make me a, a complete person. Uh, I can't overstate enough uh, the power of reading uh, and how that will uh, change a young person's life. Our library is great for many reasons. It's innovative programs and services. The great leadership of our library commissions, commissioners and city librarian John Zabo the staff of professional librarians, and the passion, the passionate support of Angelinos, especially those who dedicate time and energy as volunteers at our libraries. In fact, there are over 5,600 people who volunteer at our city libraries. Last year, they gave more than 173,000 hours of service. I am proud to honor our library volunteers today especially in the month of April, which is National Volunteer Month. I express my deep appreciation for truly making our libraries, our neighborhoods, and our residents better through their dedication and hard work. And lastly, a quote from one of the great authors, Ray Bradbury, and he said, you don't have to burn books to destroy a culture, just get people to stop reading them. Yeah, Wise words. Uh, so thank you, congratulations volunteers, congratulations to the city library system. Uh, it's a real honor to be here today. Thank you. And, uh, in this large crowd, as someone great that I forgot to introduce, a former councilwoman, former great educator at LA Unified, former commissioner, commissioner now, Rita Walters. Rita, say something there, this is it, she's it. Good morning to everybody, and good morning to Mr. President. I want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your schedules to recognize the volunteers of the library. The library, there's, I don't think there's a better place to volunteer in Los Angeles than the libraries of the city. And we are so fortunate to have a new city librarian who is just outstanding, John Sabo. He is absolutely, 
He is absolutely the perfect librarian, and I am so proud of the way he has come to our city and taken hold of our libraries and are moving them forward. And we are moving forward. The hours are being restored. You know all of that. So keep it in mind when you do budget that you won't cut us. Good, Good job. Okay. Good job, Rita. Hey, Rita. Hey, Rita. You know what you just said reminded me? There's a real tough investigative reporter standing over there, and if he went into any one of the libraries, he would see how the people get their money's worth, how the people come to the libraries, how hard the librarians and the, and the volunteers work. This is, if ever I want to feel good about city's dollars being spent, I go to a library and I feel so good because everybody's there enjoying it. And the leader of that, the chief librarian, the one and only John Sabo, give him a big hand. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Councilman Labange, uh, O'Farrell, and the entire city council for this recognition. It is a great day. It's always a great day at the Los Angeles Public Library. But to be able to say thank you in this special way to our volunteers is really wonderful. Our incredible library staff throughout our 73 libraries, I know, does a great job saying thank you every day because volunteers are in our libraries every single day of the week doing wonderful work, uh, but to, to be able to have this recognition on this special day is fantastic. Over 5,600 people and growing, volunteering in our libraries in so many incredible ways from neighborhoods all across the city. And the wonderful volunteers behind me are from all parts of the city. They've come from uh, every corner, uh, every neighborhood uh, to be here today, and we certainly want to thank them. Uh, our volunteers are teaching adults to read. They're reading to toddlers at Lapsit Story Time. They're volunteering in our 68, yes, 68 Friends of the Library groups. Uh, they're selling books to help raise money to enhance library services. Uh, and also a, a huge thank you to our library staff. We have a very talented group of people who work in the Los Angeles Public Library. And, and every time we recognize and thank volunteers, it's important to recognize our staff because to have a successful volunteer program requires staff who are welcoming of volunteers into the library, uh, who know how to engage them in library services and make it successful. And of course, we all know that the value of our volunteers is priceless and the value of the hours that they contribute is absolutely priceless. But we've attempted to put a monetary value on it. And so we have a check today to present to the city of Los Angeles representing uh, the value of that 173,000 hours volunteered in our libraries, $4,279,646.25. So we want to present that to the city of LA. Thank you so much, and let's give our volunteers a big round of applause. Please uh, do not let uh, Mr. LaBange hold on to that check too long. Good job. Tom, I got an eye on you. One eye. Hold it. Come on. You want to come down? Got it right there. Here we go right there. All right, we did it right now. Yep, we're good. All right, good job. And Mr. LaBange, I have one more member that would like to say a few words. So after your photo opportunity, I'd like to recognize uh, Joey B., Joe Buscaino. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Tom, Mr. Zabo, uh, for bringing our volunteers of, from our libraries across the city. Um, recently, as you know, uh, Mr. Zabo, we celebrated uh, the anniversary, the Henderson anniversary of the San Peter Library with our friends of the San Peter Library. Where I see some members there. I see Grant uh, Reed as well, who uh, volunteers at our Harbor City Library. But uh, and one volunteer that we treasure in the city of Los Angeles is the First Lady of CD4, Bridget LeBonge, who's here. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you very much, Bridget. And thank you uh, to all of our um, friends of the public libraries here in the city of Los Angeles. We say thank you. We love you. Um, and we're so grateful for your, your, for your, your hours of service um, in our public libraries. Thank you. Again, thank you, Mr. LeBonge. Where's uh, Mr. Koretz? 
Mr. Koretz. Okay, so it's it, now I got some new information. Mr. Parks, would you be ready in a few seconds to proceed? So, Mr. Parks, the floor, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Today, we're going to honor a person that's very special to the city and across this nation, uh, Tavis Smiley. Would you have your family come up? <laughs> Tavis is being joined by his family members and friends today. Uh, we're recognizing Tavis uh, as a TV personality who was honored yesterday, April the 24th, by the Hollywood Chamber as with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame near the famous corner of Hollywood and Vine. His presenters on that occasion was Jay Leno and Larry King. Tavis was born in Gulfport, Port, Mississippi. His family later moved to Indiana and he went on to attend Indiana University. Subsequently, he moved to Los Angeles to serve under Mayor Tom Bradley before venturing into the broadcast media, media. From his celebrated conversations with world figures to his work to inspire the next generation of leaders, Tavis, a broadcaster, an author, publisher, advocate, entrepreneur, and philanthropist, has emerged as an outstanding voice for change. He is currently the host of the late night television show Tavis Smiley on PBS, as well as the Tavis Smiley show for from Public Radio International. In addition to his radio and television work, Tavis has written 16 books, 16 books, including a New York Times bestseller. His forthcoming book to be published in September 2014 is titled The Death of a King, the real story of the last year in the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Tavis was the presenter and creative force behind America I Am, the African-American imprint, this un unprecedented traveling museum ex exhibition, which debuted in January 2009, toured the U.S. for four years, celebrating the extraordinary impact of African-American contributions to the U.S. and the world, as delivered through rare artifacts, memorabilia, and multimedia. Many of the artifacts Tra T uh, Tavis discovered and displayed during the America I Am tour are now on permanent display at the Smithsonian Institute. Tavis' most gratifying accomplishments are rooted in his commitment to champion human rights and empowerment issues and his passion to inspire the next generation of leaders. Since its inception, the Tavis Smiley Foundation has provided leadership training and development for more than 6,500 young people through the Youth to Leaders training workshops and conferences. Expanding upon Tavis's previous anti-poverty work, the foundation recently launched Ending Poverty, American Silent Spaces, a four-year national initiative to examine barriers and identify solutions to reduce hardship among all our most vulnerable citizens. As part of the initiative, he will embark on a series of town halls across the country beginning June 26 in Los Angeles. Tavis is also the CEO of the Smiley Group, Incorporated, which serves as a holding company for various entrepreneurs encompassing broadcasts, print media, lectures, symposiums, book publishing, and digital platforms. His achievements have earned him numerous awards and honorary doctorate degrees, including one from his alma mater, in Indiana University. In 2009, Indiana University named the Atrium of its School of Public and Environmental Affairs building, the Tavis Smiley Atrium. Tavis is also the recipient of the prestigious Du Bois Medal from Harvard University and the 2009 Independent Day Prize from Demos in Istanbul, Turkey. Time Magazine is named Smiley one of the world's 100 most influential people. Today, it's a great pleasure to congratulate him on the occasion of being honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame the work he's done throughout the community and the world, and to uh, which is commemorable and will be long and cherished by many. 
We want to make best wishes and continue future success. Just like to add a personal comment. I met Tavis a hundred years ago when he first came to Tom Bradley's office as an intern. And he was a person that had more energy, more involvement. Tavis was everywhere. And as I mentioned to him this morning, the same thing, he says, well, I'm still energetic. I'm still doing a lot of things but I'm now old. So he said two out of three isn't bad. So <laughs> we want to say congratulations and honor today and wish you all the best in the future. Before you uh, speak, kind sir, I'd like, I'm looking for Mr. LaBange, who's running around here somewhere, but it, it's just funny. It seemed like it was only yesterday that Mr. LaBange, you and I, were running around this building. <laughs> we were staff, you were staff for the, the mayor, I was staff for Councilman Nate Holden. LaBange was with uh, uh, John Ferraro, and there's a special bond between uh, staff people. And, and we always knew that you were gonna go somewhere. I just didn't know where the heck you were gonna <laughs> go. Okay, I, I, we're all very proud of you, and we consider you uh, like our homegrown. I mean, City Hall grown. So I, I'm unbelievably proud and also happy. It was an honor and a pleasure to meet your, uh, your mother and, and your father. As a parent myself, these are the moments we live for. And so, Mom and Dad, I congratulate you. And with that said, the floor is yours. Oh, great one. Mr. President, let me start. Thank you. Let me start by thanking you for those kind words, Mr. President, and to uh, my councilman in the, the great 8th District, Councilman Bernard Parks, thank you for this similar recognition and honor today. Uh, it is the case, Mr. President, as you just noted, that my public service career started right here in this very building, not working just for Tom Bradley, the great mayor of this uh, metropolis, but also working for the former president of this city council, Pat Russell. So I work for Councilwoman Russell and for Mayor Bradley. So my public service career started here in this building. And I'd like to think that the work that I've been doing now for 20 plus years, uh, primarily through public television and public radio, is an extension of my public service. I think public television and public radio, not unlike our public libraries we just ce celebrated a few moments ago, public institutions are at their best when they're challenging fellow citizens to re-examine the assumptions they hold, when they're helping fellow citizens expand their inventory of ideas, when they're introducing fellow citizens to each other in the most multicultural, multiracial, multi-ethnic city in the world that I'm proud to call home, the city of Los Angeles. So it has been a long journey uh, from City Hall to, to public television to the public airwaves, but uh, I look back on these days fondly. Um, as uh, Councilman Parks mentioned, uh, I'm not as young as I was running around City Hall. As a matter of fact, later this year, I will turn 50. And as I get older, I, I, I think about... I dream of 50. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and I'm scared of it, but that's another conversation for another time. But uh, as, as I approach that, that date in September, I've been thinking about what this all means, Mr. President. And it seems to me that life is not so much about the milestones, but about the moments. Life is less about milestones and more about moments. And so this star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame yesterday uh, was a great honor, and I'm humbled to have received it and humbled to be celebrated here today. But this milestone allows me to reflect on the moments in my life, and I will never treasure any part of my life more than the time I spent in this very chamber running around after Pat Russell with her work on the city council and certainly hanging out and doing everything I could to support my boss, the late great mayor of this city, Tom Bradley. So it's great to be back in City Hall once again, as you mentioned, my parents are here, my mother and father, Emery Smiley, and Joyce Smiley. Let's give them a round of applause. My parents are here. And uh, for those who've known me since my days at City Hall, they know that I come from a very large family. I have nine brothers and sisters, and my family are all with me today. Let me call their names so they don't feel slighted. Pamela, Phyllis, Garney, Paul, 
Patrick, Mari, Derwin, Weldon, and Dion, my nine siblings as well. So my family came out from Indiana to celebrate this occasion with us. And uh, again, I want to thank you for the honor of receiving this proclamation. Thank you for the opportunity to come back uh, to this place that I, that I view as sacred uh, and so important in my own development, in my own life. And uh, once again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, share these words. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilman Parks, I thank you. Appreciate it. And, and Mr. Tavis, uh, and, and I think as, as president, I'll, I'll, the members will allow me to do that, do this. We also have with us another part of our family, mm -hmm. another individual that was part of our family back in the good old days, uh, Pastor Kenneth Flowers, who was the president of the Civil Service Commission at the, uh, the, the, the time we all were running this building. But quickly, just say something. To my friend and my brother, Tavis, congratulations on the signal honor. It is because of you that I became a commissioner with Mayor Bradley, and I thank and praise God for your friendship through the years. I could not leave Detroit without saying I love you. I thank God for you and your family. Thanks for being a great friend, and 50 is not bad. Congratulations. One of the, Mr. President, Mike, one of the great, one of the great joys of working for Tom Bradley was allowing um, so many other young African Americans and people of color in this great city um, to hear my story of the work I was doing inside City Hall and to organize a group called LA's Young Black Professionals. And so I brought these young black professionals throughout the city of LA together and got them involved in all kinds of city activities. And Reverend Flowers, as you mentioned, uh, went on to become a city commissioner, being brought into the work that, the, that this city is doing. And Reverend Flowers is just one of many uh, friends. I have a lot of other friends and staff who are with me today. Friends, the, stand up and wave. Been, Let's my, give my, all My staff, friends. my friends who joined me here today have been on this journey as well. So thank you to all of them. And Reverend Flowers, thank you as well. Mr. President, thank you very much. No, thank you and congratulations. Okay, as they depart, Mr. Cedillo, uh, are you ready to move forward with your presentation? Okay, then the floor is yours. And Madam Clerk, let's uh, send item eight forthwith. Mr. President, first let me add my voice to those who are here to praise uh, Tavis Smiley for his great leadership. Uh, never shy about raising controversial issues that we have to address and uh, uh, an award much, much deserved, my brother. Appreciate you. Mr. President, you know that I enjoy history, or let me say, you know that I value history and appreciate the importance of knowing uh, our history because of its importance, what it teaches us so that we don't have to repeat many of the errors. In August, on August 29th, uh, 1970, it was one of the most seminal moments in this nation, speaking of moments, for the Mexican-American community. It was on that day that the largest protest ever in the history of this community took place in the United States. It took place in East Los Angeles, where over 25,000, uh, as we referred to ourselves in during the, that time period, 25,000 Chicanos showed up from Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, Nevada, California, Illinois, New York, throughout the entirety of this country, showed up to protest the Vietnam War, showed up to protest the uh, high rate of fatalities. Uh, Chicanos, Mexican Americans, believe it or not, were only 5% of the population at that time. Hard to think of this community as a minority community. And yet we're 25% of the fatalities in Vietnam. We considered the war unjust. And we considered it unjust specifically as it related to the Mexican-American community. And so it was the largest march that was convened. It was convened by the Chicano uh, National Moratorium Committee. In that march, it was peaceful. There were celebrations. There was a wedding. There was mariachis. There was music, culture, dance. Uh, it was a great celebration. Unfortunately, as is the case in many instances, uh, this 
gathering at what was then Laguna Park was attacked. It was attacked by the sheriff's department. Uh, people uh, had to run, or, were they, or they were pelted. Uh, they were hit by the batons, uh, and they all took off down the Whittier Boulevard in protest. Unfortunately, violence broke out. People started burning buildings, engaging in activity that we do not support but understand. At the end of that street was a bar, and in that bar sat the voice of the Mexican-American community at that time. Ruben Salazar was a journalist, award-winning. He was the head of a television station. Uh, he had uh, served our country, uh, gone around the world to cover battles and wars throughout, and had won many awards for them. He worked for the Los Angeles Times and wrote many important editorials explaining to the rest of our community and the nation what these young Chicanos were talking about, why they were so concerned about the issues of the day. Regrettably, tragically, sadly, on that day, a projectile was fired into the Silver Dollar uh, bar where he was sitting, and he was killed. And so uh, on August 28th, we are going to declare it Ruben Salazar Day. So I'm here to for that declaration. But in addition to that, we are going to have a screening. PBS will run a screening on the life and times of Ruben Salazar. And it will run on April 29th. And so we're here to announce that on April 28th, we will declare that day. On the 29th, PBS will run a documentary on the life and times of Ruben Salazar. And we are here very uh, pleased to have the documentarian, uh, Philip Rodriguez, is well known, uh, well established in his own right as a documentarian, a thoughtful leader in our community. Uh, but Mr. President, you also know uh, his cousin, uh, Dario Fromer, and I only say that as a point of reference uh, so that uh, you can understand um, the milieu that uh, Philip emerges from. Uh, for his political leadership and vision that he provides, both in the documentary and his other works. And so please receive Philip Rodriguez, the documentarian of Ruben Salazar, a man in the middle. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much to Councilman Cedillo. Thank you to members of this uh, body. Um, we have made, indeed, a quite beautiful film uh, about of an important Los Angeles historical figure that has really not gotten his due. Like so much of Los Angeles history, uh, it's been kind of still relegated to the margins in the national narrative. And we are now, at this generation, I believe, will start insisting uh, on, on the inclusion of not you know, simply Los Angeles is replete with great stories. This is one of them. A very important story about a number of things, including uh, uh, what it means to be an American, uh, state surveillance, uh, the power of the press, and courage of conviction. And we're hoping that Americans and Angelino specifically will tune in April 29th, 9 p.m. PBS to witness this. In order to make this film, we needed to release from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department nine homicide files. That, uh, that the that department had refused, essentially, to provide the public, public, public record that uh, they had uh, been very reticent about showing us. We, we won with the help of Maldef, uh, and uh, I would like now to introduce uh, one of the lawyers at Maldef that made uh, this historical finding available to us so that we could share it with the Los Angeles uh, public and with the, and the American at large. Matthew Berrigan, young lawyer. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's been great, an honor to uh, help this project proceed and to represent the filmmaker and on behalf of the family compel the Sheriff's Department to release those records that were long overdue uh, to be shared with the public. So thank you so much for honoring us today and this great film. Thanks. Mr. President, as you know, favorite part of this job for all of us is the presentation of these resolutions, and so I want to present this to you, Philip. Thank you. Uh, Ruben Salazar's day on mm -hmm. April 28th. All right, can we take Thanks a picture? Thanks to our lawyer. I know he, yeah. the, the, this is the best. Do Doogie Hauser of, of Latino <laughs> lawyers right here. <laughs> oh. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Gilbert. Thank I'll see you on Saturday. See you on Saturday. Thank you. Excuse me. 
Thank you, Mr. Cedillo. Okay, now, Madam Clerk, we're going to take up item 11. If I could get Ms. Pugh, Ms. Buick, and Mr. D.C. to come forward and sit at the uh, center table so that, so that you could be grilled. But before, before we get to that uh, point, I've been informed that I have two cards. So if you guys would sit... And let me call up the, the general, uh, well, I have more than two cards. No, I have uh, Mr. Walsh, Dr. Tom Williams, and Juan Acala, if you please come forward. Mr. Walsh. Followed by Dr. Williams, followed by Juana Collin. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org or J. Walsh Confidential and tweeting at Hollywood Dems. This is number 11. This is uh, integrating existing work source center services for uh, students and family population. Uh, we feel that you're doing... Remember, I don't get up here and just attack you people, only when you deserve it. And when you do a good job, I tell you you do a good job. So you never know what I'm going to say, right? And I'm going to say here that you're doing an excellent job. And occasionally you do do an excellent job. But stay tuned for public comment, and I'll tell you where you do a bad job. HollywoodHighlands.org. Dr. Williams? Good morning, Dr. Tom Williams. It's an interesting juxtaposition between item 11 and item 12. Cradle to career. Why can't we get some state funding for our item 11 and start mimicking the item 11 to that of 12? If it's good enough for the state, it should be good enough for LA. So highly recommend that you amend it and perhaps add an amendment to item 12 such that you can get started now with item 11 oasis now it works thank you mr akala yes timekeeper i only wish to speak one minute stop Stealing my minutes. And you know what I'm going to say? Stay, the whole no, what you're going to do is stay on the subject. That's what you're going to do. Yes. You're going to stay on the subject, so go right ahead. I don't even know what the damn subject is. Okay, then your time has expired. I believe that is uh, the last uh, uh, speaker from the public. So with that said... Mr. LeBange. I just want to say, Mr. President, you look at this table, and you look, and I know, and I hate to give a football analogy, Mr. Superintendent, but I will. This is first round draft choices for excellence. <laughs> so I want to congratulate everybody and all that they do. Thank you. I vote. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yep. Maybe, Courtney, you would start. Thank Good you very see much. You. Likewise. Uh, esteemed members of the City Council, President Wesson, my name is Courtney Pugh. I'm the Executive Director of SEIU Local 99. Uh, joined with me at the table to my right is Dr. Elsa Mendoza, the Principal of Venice High School. Uh, Patricia Jones, who is a Local 99 member and a Special Education Assistant at Fremont High School. Uh, Elise Buick, the President and CEO of the United Way of Los Angeles, and uh, Superintendent John Dacey, Superintendent of the LAUSD. Uh, joining also are in the audience are many members of uh, uh, SEIU Local 99 and community allies. And I also would like to mention Mr. Eliseo Medina, who uh, in comprehensive immigration reform just uh, uh, joined us in Washington, D.C., ending a fast for families. And we're very happy that um, they're all here joining us. 
Local 99 is uh, a classified school employees union. We represent cafeteria workers, custodians, bus drivers, special education assistants, and others who provide essential services to students at LAUSD. I ask you to support the OASIS program. Your vote of approval will help build an increased partnership between our city, the Los Angeles Unified School District, that will transform our schools into centers of support for families, improve student outcomes, and increase good jobs. At the heart of this motion is an innovative new program developed by SEIU Local 99 called OASIS. It stands for Optimizing Access to Services Inspiring Success and will improve the coordination of services provided by the city and county of Los Angeles to LAUSD students and families. It will help address many of the challenges faced by students from low wage families by bringing existing public and private programs directly onto our local public schools. Many local 99 members are parents of children in LAUSD. We recognize that students often attend school overwhelmed by issues of poverty, hunger, illness, and other problems at home. And at the end of the school day, many of these students do not have an adult to go home to because so many struggling parents are working multiple jobs or non-traditional hours to make ends meet. We know these issues that occur outside the classroom have a deep impact on student, achieve, student achievement inside the classroom. It's why we created OASIS and why we are excited that the program will be launching this summer. OASIS recognizes the whole child. By offering city services in our neighborhood schools, such as job training, job placement, sharing public library access for every student and parent, and providing cultural and recreational opportunities, the city of Los Angeles will partner with the district and the education workers of Local 99 to support student achievement, promote economic stability for their parents, and ultimately build a better city. With that, I'd like to ask Superintendent Daisy to say a few words. Thank you. Buenos dias, good morning, good council morning. president and members of the council. Um, we simply need to do whatever it takes to close the educational opportunity and achievement gap in LAUSD. So with the new local control funding formula, California has wisely decided to bring more investments directly to schools, but specifically to schools of greatest need. OASIS, this program which I'm incredibly proud of, reinforces these efforts. It adds a different dimension. It looks to what happens with our youth when they leave us each afternoon before they return to us in the morning. OASIS simply cares what took place last night in the lives of our students and when they're affected before she returns to school in the morning. After years and years of budget cuts, LAUSD has still managed to make phenomenal progress in our achievement, in our graduation rates, in reducing the number of youth who are suspended, and we're proud of it, but it's not enough. We have and welcome new challenges, certainly the new curriculum, which is the most rigorous we've ever implemented in California. The OASIS model increases our after-school investments in our families, which is exactly what the youth of LAUSD need so that they can be prepared to be college and career ready with these new standards. I personally very much applaud our partners. I am very proud to be the superintendent of the schools with one of our family union members of SEIU Local 99. They encourage, they push, they support us to better utilize our campuses so that we can deliver, as partners, these critical resources. You see, they are our moms and dads and caregivers. And when their voice is at the table, we can only do right by youth. We urge your support, as I strongly support, looking at OASIS as a model. Not simply where we start it, but as we're able to spread it throughout the district. Courtney, thank you very much for bringing it to us, and we look forward to being a firm and strong partner with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Superintendent. Next, we have Dr. Elsa Mendoza, who is the principal of Venice High School. Hello there. Good morning. Venice High School is committed to the students and families in our school and the community. We have a dedicated team of educators and school employees who actively engage students in learning and personal development. Venice High School has 2,200 students enrolled and close to 60% of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch. 
And while Venice High School has a long tradition of achievement in the classroom and on the field, we have a great football team and other wonderful sport teams, um, our students and their families face challenges every day that includes homelessness, poverty, mental health issues, drug addiction, and on that challenge them to finish their high school diploma and pursue higher education. Currently, we like, we, like schools across the nation, are embarking down the road towards common core implementation. These new standards challenge school districts to increase student thinking, among other skills, in the classroom. The Common Core also recognizes the interconnectedness of subject areas and asks us to take a holistic approach to instruction. It is with this holistic approach in mind that we come to you today. The city and the school district have a mutual interest in improving the lives of their children and their families. Education is a key to upward mobility. However, our communities face many challenges. By working together, LAUSD and LA City can more effectively and holistically support the needs of our students and their families. More families are connected to schools than any other institution in the community. Families are more likely to walk onto a school campus than they are a city or county building. The motion before you today will revolutionize the relationship between our schools and the city. OASIS will create a vehicle by which LAUSD and city employees can work together to ensure all children in Los Angeles have an opportunity to succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Patricia Jones, who is both a parent and a member of Local 99. She is a special education assistant at Fremont High School. Good morning. My name is Patricia Jones and I'm a special ed assistant at Fremont High School. And I have worked for the Los Angeles Unified School District for almost 30 years. The OASIS program at Fremont will help us to give more attention to what's really going on in students' lives and their family. My union, Local 99, will be the key to ensuring that more students take advantage of the services. Why? Because many times, it is the local 99 members who the family and the children reach out to first. Most of us come from the neighborhood. I myself live only about 10 minutes from campus. And it is a natural fit that we would be more involved in making sure that kids succeed and the parents get the support they need and have more output. One of the biggest issues I see at Fremont High School is absenteeism and kids addiction. I'm hopeful that OASIS program will reduce this. I also think that we need more campus aides. We've lost a lot of these positions during the last few years of budget cuts. More campus aides for us would mean less students cutting class and ditching. I am glad that OASIS will work with the parents too. Some parents don't even know that their child is failing. As OASIS services attract more parents to be on campus, the parents can naturally be more involved. While they're there getting a job referral, they can stop in at the principal's office or they can stop in and talk to their teachers and see how their child is progressing. I think that the possibilities, well, they're just endless. We offer more, we can offer more parenting classes, health resources, all bringing more and more parents to Fremont High School, which we definitely need. I also see an opportunity for Oasis to bring back some of the fun to Fremont. We used to have school plays, modern dance, cooking class, auto shop, and field trips. It is activities like these that help children blossom and flourish. And I think that Oasis can be a great way to introduce these things and give children a full high school experience like the ones you and I had. And in closing, I would like to say that I am very proud to be a Local 99 member and excited that my school is one of the four pilot schools to launch this OASIS program. And I urge you to support this measure, this motion, excuse me, as we strive to address the needs of free my kids both inside and outside of the classroom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. 
And last but certainly not least is Elise Buick, President and CEO of the United Way of Los Angeles. Elise, it's good to see you. The last time you and I were hanging out with JC. What can I say? Jay Z, <laughs> so everybody knows we're cool. That's right. But I have to say, I want to really salute Patricia and her 30 years of Wonderful. service to our students. Let's give her another round. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you've done. Maybe we'll take her over Jay-Z. What do you think, Council President? Looks I'm like thinking. she wants to go. All right. Okay. Um, good morning. I'm thrilled to be here. And I think this is such an important resolution. There's been a lot of discussion about what happens in the classroom. But we haven't had enough discussion about what happens outside of the classroom. The majority of our students are children of poverty. They are homeless. They are hungry. They are struggling. They are alone because their parents are working multiple jobs. So I'm just thrilled to see that this city council is taking leadership to look at how we can really surround our schools with the services that our families need. One benefit of this program that I think we may overlook is that we know, as was mentioned, when there is high parental involvement in our schools, our children benefit. I think the OASIS program will be a magnet in bringing parents in because it's so um, inclusive in its service delivery, health and wellness, workforce development, academic supports, and arts and personnel development. The council has a chance to really make our schools a sanctuary for families, so I urge you to pass this resolution this morning for our children that live in poverty. All right. I do have uh, one of my colleagues uh, would like to say a few words, a couple of colleagues. I'd like to first go to Mr. Bonin. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, each and every one of you. I am so excited by the promise of this program and what it can bring. Uh, I'm particularly excited to see you here, the president of, of Venice High, or the principal of Venice High. Uh, I'm delighted that a school in my district has been chosen, but I think it's important to underscore that it's not just CD11 residents who go to Venice High. I had a delegation of students in here the other day from Venice High as part of a leadership academy, and I met with students not only from the Venice area, but from MacArthur Park from South Los Angeles, from other parts of Los Angeles. And so this is something that benefits the entire city and particularly those vulnerable uh, targeted populations that, that Elise talked about. So I'm, I'm beyond stoked by, by what we have the potential to do here and I look forward to helping in any way I can push this forward and, and, and make it work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, thank you Mr. President. What a terrific idea, what a terrific program. I also want to commend all of you for your years of work uh, for public education. Um, it, it, sort of to pick up on, on Mike's uh, comment about the vulnerable populations, uh, how will these be rolled out, how these programs, how will, will uh, school selections be made? I'm, I'm keenly interested in that because we have such a need in the 13th and as well as across the city. So um, Courtney's entire team and our team chose first to make sure that we had a successful launch. So we worked with four schools with very high need populations that actually begins next month. Mm -hmm. So that when we have a successful summer under us, then the opportunity is to find continued funding so that we could do this across LAUSD. You all represent portions of LAUSD. There's no portion that does not have youth who need these services. So we want to make sure we've had a successful launch, and then we can spread this issue of scale, in my opinion, as rapidly as possible. I mean, I think it goes without saying normally, we try to create programs and come to our unions to support them. Right. Union walks into the office with a brilliant program and says, would you be a partner? This is a very exciting moment. So a criteria, a criteria will be? established criteria is established for density and need uh -huh. um, and services that we can provide terrific thank you <clears throat> mr. Fuentes thank you uh, mr. president and uh, obviously thank you for uh, the makers of the motion for this uh, measure I think it's uh, incredibly overdue I don't know if you all remember, but 10, 15 years ago, you'd hear on the nightly news these terrible tragedies. And for whatever reason, there was this sort of rash of children falling into wells. 
and you would hear for weeks upon weeks about children in wells, and they'd fly in engineers, they'd fly in the resources necessary to save these young people who would fall into to wells. Bill Shore, in his book Revolution of the Heart, 20 years ago, makes the following analogy, that the children living in wells today are the children in poverty. We know that one in four is a statistic for California, but when you look at the county of Los Angeles, the constituency that you all are serving, we have so many children trapped in those wells. And for whatever reasons, colleagues, we don't hear about it on the nightly news every single night. We don't marshal every resource and engineer possible to solve the problem. We don't put, I think, that forward in the loading order of service delivery that we need to provide as government. And so this pilot program that I'm excited is going to come back in 45 days to understand how it's working and how we can improve upon it, I think is a real opportunity, and thank you, Superintendent, for everything that you're doing with the school district. It's an op opportunity for us to marshal those resources, create those linkages and coordination, synchronize our community block grant funding through the uh, Family Source Center, which this motion does, and figure out how to deliver all of the services possible to make it so that young people have an opportunity to be successful in this great country, this state, and this city. It is absolutely our future and a pressing need. So this is a long time coming, and so I'm very excited about it. The suggestions I, I would make uh, sort of going forward is um, how do we add additional service delivery uh, work to all of this? How do we make sure that street services is prioritizing those ramps and those sidewalks and the proper drainage and all of the sort of things to make it so that children and parents can get to school. In my district, for many years, if it was a really rainy day and we're expecting rain finally, thank goodness, tonight, it'd be difficult to even get to school, let alone have sort of the nutrition that you needed and sort of the activity and background to be successful. I would uh, press upon us to sort of consider uh, where we do all of that stuff after obviously you've come back uh, and demonstrated to us what's missing. But I think what you all are starting here today is a tremendous, tremendous program and a real opportunity for us to begin to cue our service delivery and our work in, in line with, at least in first in order, with young people and the impact that we can have on them. So thank you very much for your willingness to do this and uh, thank you for what I know is going to be success in the future. Mr. Koretz, followed by Mr. Price, followed by Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a very exciting program. Uh, it's a great approach to uh, the needs of our students who need it most and a holistic approach and a great next step in uh, uh, the recovery of LAUSD, which is a story that I still don't think is being adequately told of how much better uh, the district is doing. Um, but I think that's very exciting. It's, a, it's an amazing approach. I don't know that I'll see a lot of it in my district, which probably has less of the need. But uh, this is great for Los Angeles and great for our students. And I'm so proud to have the opportunity to support this along with the rest of my colleagues. Mr. Price. Thank you, Mr. President. I, just, I too, want to just rise and, and congratulate the collaboration. This is an exciting partnership between the school district uh, and, uh, and 99, more importantly, uh, with our, within the community. It, this effectively turns our campuses into, into community centers in a real holistic kind of way. Uh, and it's exciting that it's going to uh, really create a template for what's going to be possible, uh, not just in underserved communities, but uh, really citywide. Uh, could you identify, though, the four schools, the four pilot schools where this program is going to be operating initially? Yeah, it's, uh, it's Venice High School, uh, Fremont High School, Audubon, and Utah. Okay, well, I think it's a good cross-section. Looking forward to the, uh, to the success and collaborating with you uh, as we make this, this a standard operating procedure in our district. Thank you. Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, this is kind of nostalgic for me because these are the same partners that came together uh, a little over a year ago to fight for breakfast in the classroom. Remember that fight? Remember the mess and the dilemma? And the adults were fighting whether kids should start the day with breakfast before they start school. Remember that fight? You were there. 
You fought and you ensured that children, before they start class every single day, had a proper nutrition breakfast, and you did that. So thank you. Thank you for the fact that you believe in our kids. Thank you for the fact that you're always willing to think outside of the box and be able to provide the necessary resources for our kids. All I can say, I've read everything about Oasis and I support it, but I do have an ask. And Mr. Superintendent, we were sort of, um, you're reading my lips, but I do have an ask. I represent some of the most neediest communities in the San Fernando Valley. Panorama City needs Oasis. North Hills needs Oasis. Sun Valley needs Oasis. My communities don't have the necessary resources or the relationships in Washington, D.C., or for that matter, in, in the state capitol. We need to be sure that the resources are brought into the most neediest communities, particularly in the San Fernando Valley. That's my only ask. I appreciate all of your help and your effort in, in moving this forward. I'm happy to support it, but we need to think that Los Angeles, and know that Los Angeles is a lot bigger, and that we have so many other families in need, and we cannot have another situation like neighborhood promise, like uh, promised neighborhoods, where there were communities that felt that they were left out. We need to ensure that we fight for every single one of these communities that need the resources to help our kids. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, members, for being so engaged. I'm excited. Uh, Glad to play a small role, and maybe, uh, Courtney, you may want to wrap this up or say a last f few words or what have you, because I feel good about this vote. Thank you, Mr. President. I always like to have the last word. <laughs> and well, you've got it. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, uh, President Wesson and, and to seconds, uh, uh, current uh, Council Member Price as well as Council Member Bonin, and I would be remiss without uh, mentioning uh, both uh, Mr. Wiesar and Ms. Martinez, who both served on um, the LA Unified School Board. Uh, thank you very much for hearing this and for your support, and we look forward uh, with uh, an I vote um, to coming back and reporting back on the progress. Okay, so members, let's uh, let us prepare to vote on this item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. The ayes have it. All right. Congratulations. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. If we could go to item 10. So, uh... Capri, do you have a, a group of some folks that you'd like to uh, bring forward? Maybe, maybe you, in fact, let me call, I have cards from the public, then I'll get, okay. let me take care of them, then I'll get to you. I have Mr. Walsh and Mr. Akala and Arnold Sachs on item 10. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. Stay tuned for general public comment. I have an announcement. Uh, this concerns a uh, uh, bill by uh, Assemblyman Holden. I, I met Nate the other day. He looks great, his father. And uh, this concerns uh, children chronically absent. Uh, as a, a teacher for one year at L in, in New York, Public this system, uh, 25 years in LA, two years for the federal government. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> I actually have a background. HollywoodHighlands.org, J. Walsh Confidential. We all 100% support this program. We want children, and we want them to eat their meals there, not throw them away. And we very much. Uh, are interested, especially in high school, where absences become chronic. HollywoodHighlands.org. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Akala? I uh, feel the same way about this issue. Uh, children are important, and uh, 
I support uh, every part of it, but I question why do we even have poverty? You know, how can the rich people know what the poor people need? So we need to do something to end this stupid cycle of poverty. And it starts with real estate. No, let's stay on the subject, Mr. Akala. Yeah, the children it's about are truancy. Important. They need up they need food, they need services. I used to be a teacher, remember? No, you don't remember. Okay. Hold me one minute. I think I'm getting your no, system. No, no, come on. Okay, good. All right then, Mr. Sachs. Come forward, sir. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Arnold Sachs. Um, several bills referring to uh, government to effectively intervene with children. Excuse me, but that's an oxymoron. Government involvement to be effective means volunteer involvement to make sure government to cover up when government misses the boat. You know, there was a little comic in the uh, LA Times about Promise Zones, a government program that was initiated by Washington, D.C. to go to help disadvantaged neighborhoods. And in disadvantaged neighborhoods missed out in L.A. You know why? They forgot to put in a request for the funds. So they said that um, the Arnold, actual... Arnold, Arnold, please. I, I'm, a, talk, I'm talking to the effective, get effectiveness back the, get back of subject, government bro. to intervene with children in schools. And if you have that kind of effectiveness, that's why you need volunteers. And if you need the volunteers, then the other question is, what is the government doing? Well, they're being effective comes back to the point of that oxymoron, governments and effectiveness. It's really Arnold, a disastrous train. So, and then, you know, I can't even talk about the campus horror show shown on the internet. More government, the schools doing their best to not provide opportunity, but to debrace to deprive opportunity. That's the government at its best. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sachs. Uh, if we can get our representatives to come forward. Capri, at this time, we do not have any speakers on the, the, the queue, so maybe it would just be appropriate for us to move forward with the, uh, the vote. That that is fine, Council Council President Wesson. Okay, so I just wanted to thank go. the I just wanted to thank the council for their support of the students in the LAUSD system. Um, and as we move forward on this item, um, I'd like to thank you for um, taking a leadership role along with Councilwoman Martinez on this issue as it relates to preventing truancy in our schools. As you know, students are more likely to become victims of crime when they're out of school, and of course, it increases their likelihood of actually committing crimes as well. I'm sitting here with Kristen Burnsog. She's our deputy city attorney in charge of our truancy pre prevention program. And I believe we also have representation from um, the AG's office. Juan, Juan, right, can you come up for a second, Juan? Juan is actually the special assistant to Kamala Harris. And as you know, he is a familiar face to our city family. He was... Um, with us in the Beater Gose administration. I don't know if he would like to add anything before you vote. I'll just make my comments brief. Uh, thank you, Council President and members of the City Council. On behalf of California Attorney General Kamala Harris, uh, we want to thank you for paying attention to this really important issue. Uh, last year, the Attorney General released a report uh, in school and on track that produced some really alarming figures. Um, and we believe, in consistent with our wraparound policy, that paying attention to elementary school truancy will have uh, a direct benefit to the state economy as well as to ongoing issues regarding uh, crime in the state of California. So thank you for your consideration, and we urge you to vote yes on the motion. Thank you. Okay, let's... Uh, I didn't hear you. 
I'd like to be very clear that the, the city attorney himself is supporting all of these um, motions that are moving forward. So thank you so much for no, your support. We support uh, and, and appreciate our attorney general and our city attorney. With that said, let's, members, let's prepare to vote on this item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 eyes. Thank you. That passes. Let's go to item nine. Uh, Madam Clerk, I have some cards on that item. So I'd like to have uh, Mr. Akala come forward and uh, Mr. Walsh and Mr. Sachs on item nine. Thank you. This is my specialty since I wrote a book on how to end homelessness. And I don't feel that the city has any business taking money away from people that already have a home. Look at all these damn liens. Um, adopt the accomplishing resolutions removing the following properties from the rent escrow account. The program rape. Uh, RIP. I read it rape for some reasons. In as much as the owners have corrected the cited RIP violations, probably had a, an extra leaf on their loan, uh, and provided proof of compliance with the Los Angeles housing and community investment department. Half the people, most of the people are homeless. What are you talking about? The housing authority. Um, proof, compliance to the Los Angeles Housing and Community Investment Department Code Enforcement Unit Inability Citations of um, Habitability citations pursuing the ordinance 173810 and adopt the funding concern the LACID. LACID is that how you read that? L A H C I D report attached to the console file. Them. I was a teacher, and I don't even know how to read. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Walsh, followed by Mr. Sachs. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. Go there. You'll be amazed, or J. Walsh Confidential, or tweeting. You'll also be amazed at Hollywood Dems. Uh, here, there are 10 delinquent landlords. What happened here, I want to explain to everybody out here, is the apartment was not kept up to code. Things were uh, wiring, many other... The people, the tenants realized this, went to the landlord. The landlord refused to make the repairs. Now, a lot of people don't understand. You Then you go to the city. The city makes the same demand of the landlord. If the landlord refuses, then the city says, okay, you pay. The, land, the tenant no longer pays rent to, the, to you. The, the landlord pays rent to us, and you don't get your money until you clean up your act. That's what it about. it's about. If you're in that situation, come here, and they'll do a good job. HollywoodHighlands.org. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. I don't like your explanation. I don't like yours. I don't give a shit what you like or don't like. No, 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 Hello? stay. Thank Talk you. To us. Good morning, Arnold Sachs. Again, um, the fact that you're doing this program, and again, I bring up this resolution from Councilman Krikorian and so seconded by Mr. Wesson, that the, uh, since the systematic code enforcement program has been in, in, in the city's charter since 1998, there are less than 1,000 substandard slum properties. So it becomes a use of manpower issue. Um, and... This article, L.A. Blight Law Goes Unenforced. L.A. May Get Tougher on Bank-Owned Properties. 
The council of the city, the mayor wants to hire 50 part-time traffic auditors, officers to increase budget funding, collect $5 million. If the Back. blight law was enforced, $1,000 a day, each one of those traffic officers has to make a hundred thousand. Mr. Sachs, back, back on the ex subject. It's about manpower and collecting funds for the city's chronic debt. Each one. Mr. Sachs, you, please, just on the subject, man. Money goes to the general funds that's collected, which goes towards the chronic debt that the city is always facing. This is a better opportunity. Part-time employees. $100,000 a piece. Back to the thing. I know. Again, it's manpower solving a city debt. You have a blight law that's on the books that's never been enforced. Uh, okay, Mr. Sachs, I can't get you to get on the to topic, so thank you. Thank you very much. Now let's, uh, let's prepare to uh, vote on this item. Let us uh, open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Okay, now we're going to go to item six, and I have uh, Mr. Sachs. And Mr. Sachs, if you come forward, we're on item six, followed by Mr. Akala, followed by Dr. Williams. We're going to have to give you a a quieter stamp over there. Do you hear about this stamp? Stamp in the date. Sounds like construction outside. So, okay, so it's my understanding, Mr. Sachs, that you have one minute, yes, and Mr. Sir. Akala, you have one. So go right ahead. Yes, thank you again, Arnold Sachs. And uh, this is a $10 million for sidewalk repair, and it's good to see that the council is taking such direct, decisive action and getting 16 positions filled in the council for, to oversee this work. You've had sidewalk neglect for 20 years. I don't know this $10 million has been in an account for a couple of years. But 16 positions to oversee this? <laughs> it's, it boggles the mind what this, how you, how you man, move and manipulate. And it brings to... Uh, um, Mind Measure R, the local return, which was supposed to help with street and sidewalk repair, except it's going for other projects, and the half cent sales tax that you want to put to the city's use. Again, not stay on the subject. Not looking into the sub, the work that needs to be done underground. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Sachs, Mr. Akala. And Mr. Akala I know. is followed by Dr. Williams. His, his mind really wanders, and you are asking him, please. Stay, stay on the subject. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, to fix the sidewalks, you don't need 16 overseers. To fix the sidewalks, you need two Mexicans, three Mexicans at most, and give them a Coke. No, come on, come on. Be respectful, Warren. Well, you know that we can do a better job than, than to be distributing the money to people that are doing nothing. You have to fix the damn sidewalk. You don't have to oversee. You don't have to make reports. You don't have to make studies. I'm sure you tripped on your way, wherever the heck you're going, right here outside of City Hall, because the sidewalks look like shit. And smell like shit. <laughs> Feel sorry for the students that that were once. Anyway, come on, Dr. Williams. One minute. Uh, Dr. Tom Williams, LA 32 Neighborhood Council. Real problem with sidewalks because in LA 32 Neighborhood Council, many of our residents don't have any sidewalks. We have curbs, yeah. So if you want to fix the curbs with general funds, hey, that's fine. But if you're going to fix sidewalks, how about those places that we don't have any sidewalks? My house and my most of my block doesn't have sidewalks because there is no room. 
So many places in CD1, many places in CD14 don't have sidewalks. So why should we be paying? Why should we be concerned about other people getting their sidewalks repaired? I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's prepare. We're ready to uh, vote on this item. Motion that's uh, been circulated. Okay, so Mr. Parks. Yes, I'd just like to make some comments. I think the problem I have with the proposal today is that the, even though we're talking about $10 million, that's at the very end of this fiscal year, but one of the issues that is glaring in the sense of uh, the report from uh, Street Services is that they're talking about adding personnel, which has always been our shortfall of getting work done. If we're going to pay a substantial amount to hire people and with no expectation that the funding will continue year after year, we've added another indebtedness on personnel that we can't afford, which adds to the uh, issue of the uh, pension and overhead and salary. I would just like to bring to your attention that uh, recently uh, we embarked in the 8th District on a program where we're using Lonnie, which is not hiring individuals. And by using our 1290 money, they believe that they, without uh, impacting city resources, will fix somewhere in the neighborhood of three to 400 sidewalks in the next year. And so I would hope that as we move forward, we would look at ways in which we did not invest in people, but we invest in the actual working uh, of, the, of the sidewalks. And it te seems to me to be a little inconsistent that on the one hand, on one part of the report, it talks about uh, having uh, the issue of uh, this work shall be done by outside vendors, but yet we're asking for people uh, to oversee that work. I would hope that uh, we also would rely on the council office to dictate what their priorities are because they're far more aware of the constant complaints uh, and the issues of liability than causing a delay by having street services go out and survey citywide what they believe the priorities are. That should be within the purview of the local council office. And I'd hope that in serving the public that we consider doing something a little different and that with this $10 million, if we split it one fifteenth, every council district could get about $600,000 and they can go about fixing sidewalks without the administrative overhead and the loss of money to hire people, which slows the process down. Mr. Krikorian. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I just uh, wanted to first of all thank our Public Works Chair, uh, Joe Buscaino, for uh, working closely with my office in developing this substitute motion. For the sake of the record, this substitute motion does not add any positions. It does not call for a, a budget appropriation for positions. The point of it is to move this money as quickly as possible into the areas where it will have the most impact in improving accessibility for the public, which is around the public's facilities. Uh, and it will utilize existing personnel to get that work uh, done starting immediately. So it isn't going to involve studies, it isn't going to involve surveys, it's going to involve uh, Recreation and Parks staff and their contractors starting work right now in uh, repairing sidewalks around public buildings. So that was the point of the substitute motion as to this $10 million. We'll have further discussion about uh, the mayor's proposal of spending $20 million for sidewalk repair in, in the proposed budget. We'll discuss that during the budget hearings. Uh, but that's the purpose of the substitute motion today. And uh, both uh, the Public Works Committee and uh, the uh, Budget and Finance Committee uh, concur with this proposal. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam Clerk, it's my understanding we have two votes here. Yes, Mr. President. First Council should vote on the question of whether to substitute. Okay. Uh, let's prepare to vote on that question. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. Next. Now Council should vote on uh, the item as substituted. And so that's what we're doing. We're actually voting on the item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. Okay. Uh, I believe it would be, do we need to adjourn or not, not adjourn, recess this meeting to go into the special? Yes, Mr. President. So why don't we do that? Blumenfeld, Bonham, Buscano, Cedillo, Englander, Fuentes, Wizard, Caresca, Corn, LaBanche, Martinez, O'Farrell, Parks, Price, Wesson, 11 members present, a quorum, Mr. President. 
Okay, Mr. Fuentes, I have a few cards. So uh, if you're okay with that, I'll dispense with the cards first. Uh, Dr. Tom Williams, Mr. Walsh, Mr. Kala, and tell me if anybody, well, no, they all get new time in this. Mr. Kala, Mr. Sachs. Start out, uh, go ahead, doctor. One minute. Dr. Tom Williams, why don't we ask this be supported if amended and include provisions for using OASIS as a specific demonstration of feasibility for this bill? So I'd highly recommend put it in as supported if amended and get some money specifically for Oasis and the city of L.A. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, Mr. Walsh, I believe you're next. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org, J. Walsh Confidential, at Hollywood Dems for tweeting. Uh, again, this is uh, a good Resolution. No, if you're out there, don't worry. I'm not going to spend two minutes talking to myself. Uh, rules elections committee waive consideration, and uh, it concerns community schools and uh, expanding cradle to career initiatives. 100% behind it, and it only took me 35 seconds. HollywoodHighlands.org. Mr. Akala, followed by Mr. Sachs. Well, I'm going to do better than Mr. Welch. I support this initiative. It's a good item. Do I remind you of uh, another guy? Let's just say on this subject. I support this item. It's a good item. Mr. Sachs. Yes, thank you again, Arnold Sachs. And again, um, the last line here, expand cradle to career initiative, such as community schools and promised neighborhoods in California, which again brings me back to promised neighborhoods. Can I talk about promised neighborhoods now and just be on the subject, sir? And an additional part of this program doesn't specify anything about regional occupation centers. SCROC is a regional occupation center that's located in the city of Torrance. But there's a regional occupation center located in West Hills. And the Torrance Center is in, in jeopardy of losing its funds, and I don't know what the, the West Hills Center is. So what are you looking at for career opportunities for those regional occupation centers that provide training to students outside of the parameters that normal high schools provide? I believe that there was a program that was wanted to be initiate, initiated for airport maintenance workers at the West Hills, or was cut, and it was asked to be put back for airport maintenance workers. So where do you stand on that, and where does this bill stand on that? And again, I talk about promised neighborhoods, and this little cartoon doesn't refer to the fact that the poorer neighborhoods neglected to put in a request for the funds, it just said that the funds were um, put towards more well-off areas instead of poverty or areas that with major poverty. And how is that certain? Well, that's because the government and its intellectual involvement in the schools and the programs that we run. Thank you. You just want to proceed with the uh, the vote, or all right. So, members, on this item, uh, if we could uh, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Okay, forthwith. And if we could uh, adjourn this uh, meeting, the special meeting, and return to the regular meeting. And where are we? Mr. President, that brings counsel to general public comment. Mr. Bonin, if I could borrow you for a second. Okay, so now we're going to go to uh, the general com comment portion.
All right, for general public comment, we have Dr. Tom Williams, followed by John Walsh, followed by Arnold Sachs. Two minutes. Dr. Tom Williams, LA 32 Neighborhood Council, also Sierra Club, Fracking Oil and Gas Committee Co-Chair. What's happening to the moratorium in LA on fracking? We don't know. We hear some things every once in a while, but then it goes away. On Tuesday night, it was really surprising, wonderful. On first reading, the city of Beverly Hills, city council approved a fracking ban. Yeah, not much concern there. Uh, in the city of Carson, on the 29th of this month, they will be extending the moratorium that they have. The city of Compton has gone through their first reading of a moratorium. So what's happened to LA? We led it before, but now we seem to be behind everybody else. The city of Compton has already had a first reading of the ordinance. So where are we? Uh, we don't know. We're trying to find out. Uh, tomorrow at Holman Church in West Adams, we'll be holding our bi-monthly, or actually twice a month, uh, meeting of the committee to figure out where to go and what to do with the city of LA, who seems to be lagging behind. We have some proposed amendments for uh, Municipal Code 1301, that would deal with it. So let's get on. When are we going to get a fracking ordinance prohibition here in city council? Thank you. Mr. Walsh. John Walsh blogging at hollywoodhighlands.org or J. Walsh confidential or tweeting at Hollywood Dems. Okay, we have a, a staff member of one of these city councilmen who was arrested last week for armed robbery. Armed robbery. This isn't sexual harassment, folks. And this was a woman who works for Mr. Parks, the Inspector Clouseau here. Now, what happened to her? If you want to see her mugshot and everything, come to our website, Kearia, K-E-A-R-I-A, -A Brown. She was, uh, and when, this was a crime of violence. When they robbed this uh, smoke shop, anybody who wasn't white, anyone who wasn't a minority was beaten up at the... So what does uh, Inspector Clouseau Parks do? He puts her on home assignment. So she's still working for us, and she has been arrested and uh, for armed robbery. That's what's going on in this city. Uh, at number two, I just found out that... Tom LaBange has already negotiated a DWP job while he was here for $210,000. Now, Ms. Edwards was told if she wanted to keep the job, it was before she came in, she had to okay it. So he, and now he's voting on DWP issues. We're asking Mike Fewer to prevent him from voting on two, hey, all he has to say, all he has to say is John Walsh is a liar, but you won't. You won't say it. And as far as Kiaria Brown, I understand that Mike Fewer, city attorney, will act as her criminal attorney. Is that true? Commit any crimes if you work here for city council, and the shyster up at Fewer will take care of everything. Ho uh, your legal battle. HollywoodHighlands.org. Uh, Mr. Sachs. Yeah. Mr. Parks. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Parks, yeah. please. <laughs> I'd just like to clarify a couple of things, not that Mr. Walsh is ever wrong, but uh, <laughs> first of all, Ms. Brown no longer works for the city of Los Angeles, so any inquiries about her should go to San Bernardino law enforcement, and whatever her criminal activity, Mr. Fuhrer will not be defending her. So I just want to clarify those two things. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Uh, Mr. Sachs, you were next. Are you waiving your opportunity to speak? Mr. Sachs, and then Mr. Alcala.
Yes, thank you. Good morning. Good, 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 good morning, Arnold Sachs. Um, I don't come down here on Tuesdays and Wednesdays anymore because I have Tuesdays I'm at the Board of Supervisors meeting and Wednesday now I'm working. So I come on Fridays. And your conduct in the last Friday I was here before April was as about as low as you can get. Now, Mr. Parks just mentioned some chucklehead who has a blogging site is never wrong. But on that Friday, you were discussing a, recommending funding for a lawsuit. And that same chucklehead got up here and described a sexual act that was pretty graphic. But you had a private report. How did he get access to that private report? I am so disappointed in this council, which is not a big thing, but especially you, Ms. Martinez, for not stepping up and saying, he just slandered a city employee. Are all your city staff now open to slanderous remarks that you can say anything? Mr. City Attorney, were you here that day? Did he slander that city, uh, city employee by making those remarks regarding that sexual encounter? Was he there? Did he read the report? Did he have access to the report? If he got access to the report and it's a document that's supposed to be confidential, you have another problem. But the fact that none of you stood up and said, those comments are slanderous and we don't allow that. The judge that ruled that you can use any language you want doesn't necessarily include slanderous attacks. And the fact that you did that that young lady should amend her complaint, sue the council, and sue that stupid jackass for making those remarks, and she should do it immediately. Juan Alcala, followed by John Kammerer, followed by Candido Marez. Hey, how come when this guy speaks, the Mr. Um, who's the uh, president? Yeah, Wilson says... Please, Arnold, get back on track. Please, Arnold, please, please. What's going on? When I get off subject, he goes, hey, you're out of order. Hey, hey, you're disrupting the meeting. Hey, hey. Is there a little bit of prejudice in his thinking? Blacks hate Mexicans. Why? Why? I think we should work together, all of us. Yesterday, I was at the Armenian genocide. You know what the Armenians told me? Get out of here. You're a Mexican. You're not an Armenian. I said, you're standing on Mexican soil. The United States took all this from Mexico. You're complaining that the Turks took your land. And I'm complaining to you that you're standing on the land that the United States States took from my country. I'm a Mexican. Aren't we in the same boat? Yes, we are. The United States has committed genocide against the Indians and a lot of other people. So, let's continue. Give a home to everybody. That's the only program that I care about. And stop poverty because... If we don't have a damn landlord to give them all the money that we make to every month, we will have a huge salary increase and we won't have all this bullshit minimum wage increases. Did you hear that, Krikorian? Your people threw me out of your demonstration, correct? You behave like a little piggy. Mr. Camera. Gee, let's tell it like it is. Good morning, Mr. President, Council Members, John Camera, Van Nuys Neighborhood Council. I'm here today to thank Ms. Martinez and her staff for working to honor Ms. Benavides, a true hero in our community and the city of Los Angeles. I'm hoping by the time you come back to the Valley in June that we'll be able to announce a date and time for the celebration of the naming of the baseball field at Delano Park in honor of Monica Benavides. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Final speaker, Mr. Candido Marez. Morning, Mr. President, Council Members, Candido Marez, um, 
proud resident of the 12th district, proud, proud resident of the 12th district. You know, when things are tough, people run, and uh, it's always easy when things are good to say you're uh, proud of being represented by uh, certain persons, and uh, Mitch Inglinger has done a wonderful job in my district. Uh, and it's like with Mr. Parks. Mr. Parks, I'm going to judge you on all the good, hard work you've done in all the years that you've been here, sir. And I'm honored to say that I, I consider you a uh, councilman and that uh, your staff has been very kind to me at times when I've needed uh, information. So, uh, again, we can uh, always judge people when they're down and out, but I think it's uh, always best to wait till uh, facts come out and uh, then you make your decisions. Um, I'm also someone who has said that I've been in love with the community of Van Nuys and I too, Ms. Martinez, would like to express uh, my concerns and my thanks to you in regards to Ms. Uh, Benavides. Uh, we have a, a new movie coming out called Superman and, or uh, Wonder, what, whatever the guy is, Spider-Man. We talk about all these heroes, but we have true heroes, true superheroes in our neighborhoods. And Ms. Benavides is one of those individuals. Uh, a long time ago, I met a woman by the name of Alma Woods. There was a library named after her, and Miss Alma Woods is a, is a superhero. Uh, Mr. Guy Gobbledon uh, from the uh, uh, East L.A. area was a true hero in our community, a superhero. So, again, uh, I want to honor those people, and I hope that by the time you do come back in June, uh, that we'll have word of a date and a time where we'll be able to celebrate a superhero in our community and in our city, Ms. Monica Benavides. Thank you, Mr. President. Council members. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that uh, concludes uh, general public comment for this day. That leaves us where, uh, Madam Clerk? Council has motions for posting and referral. If we could consider those posted and referred. That clears the desk. Okay, now, members, it's time for announcements. Any announcements? If I could ask everyone to please rise. For adjourning motions, if I could ask everyone in the council to uh, please rise. Mr. Fuentes. Mr. President, um, Patrick Daniel O'Brien, age 67, passed away on April 5th, 2014 in my district. He was born on June 27th, 1946, and was an Air Force veteran of the Vietnam War. He had a successful career in the aerospace industry and worked at JPL for over 25 years. He was also an active member of the Sunland Tahunga American Legion Post 377, the Sunland Tahunga Elks Lodge and Sunland Tahunga Neighborhood Council. He is survived by his mother, Marie O'Brien, wife, Katie O'Brien, and two daughters, uh, Kelly and Shannon. Services were held on April 12th at Eternal, Eternal Valley Memorial Park Mortuary in Newhall. Uh, in lieu of flowers, uh, please consider making a, do a donation to the Sunland Tahunga American Legion Post 377 or the Sunland Tahunga Elks Lodge or the charity of your choice. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I'm looking for other adjourning motions. I want to take a moment, uh, members, uh, and I, I won't say much at all because I don't think that I can. I would like for us to adjourn in the memory of my first cousin, a very young man of only 54 years of age, that passed away uh, 48 hours ago. So that's, if we could adjourn in the memory of Wayne Ricky Wesson, I'd appreciate that. With that, uh, Mr. Cedillo. President, I want to take a moment during the break. Um, all of us were away, but I saw this notice and I thought it was important uh, for the city to speak on this. Uh, as you know, my father was a boxer uh, at his young age. And so I grew up in that household, punching bags and speed bags, et cetera. So one of the persons that I knew, the star of the day, was Reuben Hurricane Carter. Yeah. Reuben Hurricane Carter was a champion. He was a great champion. Uh, but he was greater outside the ring than inside the ring because he was one of the first persons that we uh, developed notoriety because of the fact that he was arrested, uh, charged, convicted with a murder that he didn't commit. And it became more popular socially, and songs by um, 
uh, Gil Scott Heron and others, and then later in a movie that Denzel Washington starred in about Hurricane Carter. Uh, during the time that he was in prison and his fight to get out and then after, uh, he was a man of incredible grace uh, and was really a, a, a spirit of, of forgiveness uh, confronting that incredible injustice of having been put in jail for a crime he didn't commit uh, at the height of his, uh, you know, of his uh, physical proudness. And so I thought it'd be appropriate for the city, uh, this great city, to acknowledge and recognize the great contributions of the life of a real champion uh, for social justice, uh, Reuben Hurricane Carter. Thank you very much. Members, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Bravo.